Um, welcome to everyone that's joined us. Uh, this is part of an ongoing series related to sustainability topics to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, this uh, topic that you're going to hear about today is on sustainable seafood, and you're going to be hearing from Armando Ubeda and Dr. Angela Collins. Um, Armando is based at the Sarasota County Extension Office, and Angela is based at the Manatee County Extension Office, and we're happy to um, share this information with you today. My name is Alyssa Vinson, and I'm the residential horticulture agent uh, here up in Manatee County, and we're excited to be working together to bring you all of this wonderful information. Um, as you'll notice, as we go throughout the program, please, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the Q&A, and we will address them at the end of of the presentation. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Armando to get started. Thank you, Alisa. That's a great presentation introduction. And thank you folks for joining us. As um, Alisa said today, our topic is sustainable seafood. And I'm gonna be your main speaker, but um, we have Dr. Angela Collins as well here. And at the end, we're gonna be able to answer questions specifically to our programs or you know, in general to this subject. So today, um, for those who might know, you might already heard about extension, but uh, we'd like to show this slide so to advertise all the other programs that we do and things that we have to offer. But the extension office, uh, it is, well, at least ours, like any other county, we have an office that is an extension of the university. It's to serve our community. So we have different programs from agriculture to youth development, like 4-H, for, for example. I'm in the natural resources department. So that's where the spoon bill is. But we have a lot of programs to offer and a lot of things that we can share with you and we are a source of information. And if you have questions, look for us and we'll help you with things that fall into these departments. So you might identify for some of our logos, uh, where Angela and I were C Grant, but there's many, many more like Master Gardeners or volu fabulous volunteers. At least I work with them. The Florida Math and Atlas program, in business is family consumer science for H, et cetera. So with that, Today, we're going to be talking about sustainable seafood. So let me move my controls out of the way. After you. Oh my God. That means I cannot see the chat. So if somebody has something in the need immediate answer, please let me know because I'm not looking at the chat. So today, basically, we're going to talk about what is seafood, why is seafood so important, some issues related to seafood, what is sustainable seafood, and some tools for you that you can use to determine if your seafood is sustainable or not. So what is seafood? Let's start with that. Seafood, as you can see by the definition there, is all fish and selfish harvest of captured fisheries and also agriculture production, and also includes freshwater environments. So when you hear the term seafood, you might think only marine coastal environments, but the term seafood also brings in the fresh freshwater environment uh, products like, you know, from agriculture. Those are some examples of things that you might see, obviously, uh, sashimi, tuna, uh, uni, which is the gonad of orchids, eating sushi, Oysters, we love oysters, blue crabs, octopus, you name it. Those are our products considered seafood. So seafood is extremely important to our economy, but also to our health and to um, to humans in general, because it's the one of the it's the highly traded food internationally. So it's, it's a product that export imports is you know enormous, and it provides livelihood for many different people around the globe, from people that depend on this the industry, like fishers to recreational fishers, to all the people that, uh, you know, traders, markets, transportation, etc. So it's a huge um, business and it contributes at least 50% of the consumption of meat protein in many different countries to point to point a billion people. And this is from a study in 2010. So I'm sure these figures have increased. Why so important seafood? Well, not only as I said before, it's a source of protein meat from a lot of many different people around the globe, but also has a lot of benefits that you probably already hear about it. I'm not gonna try to um, pronounce some of these <laughs> acid names, but I will talk to them about it. So you have uh, polyunsaturated long chain fatty acids. Those are fatty acids that actually are healthy for you. They have acids that actually help with brain development, heart, prevent heart disease, cancer, many other different things that they're important to us. A lot of elements that we need for our bodies, like potassium, sodium, et cetera. A lot of vitamins are found in different seafoods. And again, it depends on the type of seafood, but they all have healthy um, benefits. 
the fish protein is highly digestible so because it have low connectivity tissue and if it is that fat it's healthy fat so um, that's very important you probably hear about omega-3 omega-3 is the, this right here this two right here that's what make omega-3 which you know you can buy as a vitamin supplement which is really great for the brain heart many other different things so it is good it's very healthy however because these animals we actually you know, take them from the wild in most cases they can be exposed to certain things that can be unhealthy for us so like water pollutants that can risk you know the consumption of seafood can be harmful toxins parasites and heavy metals especially when you hear the word um, heavy metals you think about mercury probably and that's something that everybody's pretty aware of but unfortunately a lot of people don't know much about the impact of mercury and seafood so i'm going to expand to that so when you think about mercury not about this mercury right here but about this mercury to the left at least well sorry to my right although i like Freddie mercury mercury it comes in two forms it's inorganic and organic matter and it can have many different shapes. If you look at the base there and the K painting, um, I think it's a bison or something like that. Those are made of some, it's called, um, oh, Sibaro, I think, I forgot. But it's some kind of natural um, mercury that you find in volcanic ashes. Normally it was used, heavily used by prehistoric civilization to create artifacts to paint their faces, to paint in caves. So that's a form of mercury. We also have inorganic mercury that we use for like, let's say batteries, thermometers and things like that. The one we should conserve, be, be conserved about is the organic mercury. The one, the metal mercury is one example of one of those. Is the one who can get into the natural system, normally gets trapped in the sediment and then passed on into through the um, to the food chain all the way to bigger fish that the one we consume. So it can accumulate in the tissue and of and the muscles of some of these animals and pass on into the higher trophic level. In this case, us we end the product. I'm putting this example here. You might have heard of Minamata disease. Um, which is associated to Minamata Bay in Japan. That's one of the well-known case studies of release of mercury from uh, industry. They were dumping mercury as a waste product to this bay, which heavily fish and where a lot of these people in that community fish for those, um, ate those fish from that bay. This is this was known in the 1950s, so it's been quite a long time. But people start getting um, speech impairment, visual constrictions, sensory disturbance, including death, and you can see there to all the things. So it can be a serious issue, but this is a highly concentrated levels of mercury into a particular system. And it was because of, you know, intentional release of mercury as a waste product of this industry. So there's natural occurrence of mercury, which is a low levels, but there is, you know, high concentration of mercury at some spot just due to industries like this one. After they find this, it became really, you know, well-known. So it's called Minamata disease, actually. Uh, some people refer it like that. And they stopped the leakage of the mercury into the bay. So it is such a big issue that NOAA, the National Atmospheric uh, National Earthics, have Center for Coastal National Science, sorry, have as a whole department just to look at a mercury hotspot. So basically areas with mercury might be accumulating in levels that it might be harmful to the to the marine life or into us eventually. So among the characteristics that fish seem to be associated with high levels of mercury, this is not black and white. So even though these are like the three most general, that doesn't mean that always the case, but fish that are too, at the top of the food web tend to accumulate more mercury just because the little fish, the, only small, the smaller fish, the, how does it go? This tiny fish, it then by the little bigger fish accumulates, and then the other one and the other one, so on. So mercury keeps passing on into the bigger fish. So fish are higher trophic level normally are the ones who accumulate more mercury if they're exposed to levels of mercury. Those species normally are pelagic. I mean, they are in the open ocean, traveling long distances, eating from many different um, stocks of fish that might have been exposed to these mercury hotspots. And also fish that grow large, but take a long time to grow, again, they are more susceptible to be accumulating mercury to a long, long period of time. And you can find out more about this if you follow the link that I posted here below to learn more about mercury. The good news is that, again, these are very localized places that they have identified with hotspots. And all studies that have been done so far, I've been looking at the benefits outweigh the risk of eating seafood. There's, you know, pregnant women and people with maybe low immune system compromise they might be a little bit more careful. But in general, there's a lot of information about where your seafoods come from. That's when I talk to you in the upcoming slides. 
for you to be sure that these are like healthy and, and sustainable seafood. But anyway, let's move on. So is your seafood sustainable? And what do we mean by being sustainable? So sea, seafood that is sustainable, it means that, this, that we are either farm or cut wild. You can maintain and increase production without jeopardizing the structure and function of the ecosystem. I mean, it's not impacting the species that we're targeting and it's not impacting the environment where it lives and it's not impacting other species that might be associated with the species that you are targeting. So for example, if you're gonna harvest, if you're gonna have uh, fisheries for let's say red drum, you're gonna make sure that you can maintain the production of, of um, the structure of the population of red drums. They don't decline, they either stay or go higher and then you don't affect all the fishes associated and all the organisms associated with you know, red, red drums, which in part are part of the big ecosystem. So again, a fishery removes tons of fish from one uh, trophic level, it can jeopardize the health of the other ones below. A fishery that have a lot of bycatch, bycatch is byproducts of fisheries, like for example, if you're trolling um, with big nets over the floor of the ocean and you're targeting for shrimp, but you're capturing tons of rays and, and, and sharks and other fish that you know when I even use it, you're discarding them. That's not a healthy, sustainable fisheries, right? And then fisheries that might impact the environment or the habitat where the species live. For example, in this case, it's a picture of somebody fishing in a, a coral reef with dynamite. So that obviously will kill a lot of fish at once that some they will never use, some of them they will use, but then it also creates destruction of the habitat where these fish depend on. So basically you, it's a one-time deal, right? So you don't want that. Same from the same study, they looked at why um, these fishers in general, they can be um, problematic in terms of management or secure a sustainable future for this industry. It's because they're daily um, tied to ecosystem health. So if you have unhealthy ecosystems, then you can collapse your fisheries, you can collapse the functionality of that ecosystem. And that means affecting the population of the species living in there. And also it's depend on common pool resources. So a lot of our fisheries happen inshore. Of course, so we have more regulations and more um, ways to control it. But a lot of these fisheries happen in international waters, shared water. So there is hardly any or very hard to regulate and to make sure things are being done in the way they're supposed to be. So those are two big issues when it relates to fisheries and to make it maybe not sustainable in some instances. From the same study, they've been looking at and I know this map is a little hard to read, but I'm gonna describe it to you. Um, what is important is the text to what is my left. So fishing can reduce target species. Target species, the fish that you're going for, but also can alter marine food webs. I already told you this. If you, let's say you remove, you know, the big predators, you might have a big impact and the herbivores below and the herbivores can create that much um, into the things below. So it creates a whole this balance and you know, keep things in shape. Poor governance, so lack of regulation, overfishing, that can create an unsustainable system. Bad aquaculture, there's many different examples of bad aquaculture where they just destroy habitat. It's, and basically they cannot use it for more than a couple of years and then they have to move to a new area. Um, but I'm gonna talk to you also about the good aquaculture in, in a second. Consumption of seafood products is not shared equally among countries. So that's what the map see there. You see that they, in the map on the top, the higher colors or the more bright colors are the higher consumption of seafood. And for most part, these countries are not the ones that produce most of the seafood. It's the other way around. The actually the countries that have, it that's the map below, they have less consumption of seafood. Sometimes are the ones who produce more seafood and they don't even get that seafood themselves. So it's not an even consumption for distribution of benefits, put it this way, the seafood provides and also corruption. A lot of these exports of seafood from these developing countries into the developed countries, then the revenue from that export is not shared equally or you know distributed for the, uh, I could just say for the benefit of the people of these little countries or those um, developing countries because there's a lot of corruption at the government level. So there's many issues with seafood um, that they make it not sustainable. In the meantime, the, all this happening and continue happening, the demand for seafood continue growing. So we still want more seafood. That's something that we, we you know, population are growing. So the demand obviously is gonna increase. So 
one thing that we look at is that in order to keep this uh, um, demand and to make it healthy, we need to include, we need to have better agriculture so we can actually start producing most of the seafood instead of just catching wild. And we also need to keep making sure that the fisheries are sustainable so we can maintain those populations or have them increase so we can continue to do this in a sustainable way. So in the United States, it is luckily for us that we live here, the United States is recognizable as a global leader when it comes to sustainable seafood, both for wild and farm fisheries. So how, why? Well, our marine wild captive fisheries are scientifically monitored. What does that mean, scientifically monitored? So scientists, there's whole people, you know, working in many different, so this, uh, this, in many areas of your state and at regional level, uh, national level, looking at the fishery data to make sure that the populations are, to find out how the populations are declining or, or, you know, or increasing or staying stable. And that information comes from the fisheries, it's come from independent fishery samples, scientists going out and they fish themselves, they look for, let's say, you want to look how snooks are doing, they get data from the people that actually catching big snooks, but they also do sampling of the little snooks, the juveniles, just to make sure that they can make projections over time and estimate how the population is doing. You know, not just looking at one size, but looking at the whole through the whole population from the little ones to the big ones. So the guys scientifically monitor each species that is fishing commercially. So we have, we can make better decisions in terms of, should we close the fishery? Should we keep it open? Can we increase the fishery? And that kind of things. They also regional manage, I already told you there's a, you know, we have a Gulf of Mexico group just looking at the Gulf of Mexico. Then you have the state looking at the state. Then you have different um, municipalities, I guess, counties looking. For example, there's some instance that some fisheries are open in the upper part of the state, but they're closed in the south because they're looking at independently. There's the same species, but different populations. So that's may make our you know country recognized as a leader in sustainable seafood because we look at a very large level and very localized level as well. We also have very good uh, reinforcements in terms of laws, enforcing the 10 national standards of sustainability through the Magnuson Stephen Fishery Conversion Management Act, long sentence. But that means that we actually, um, you know, put very strict regulations to make sure that our fishery is sustainable. And you can learn more about this. NOAA has this um, page called Fish Watch, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about it. But it has all the seafood facts, so for it, at the species level to the regional level, so it's a very good resource for you to learn more about how the state is actually leading and sustaining the seafood. So agriculture production, there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to agriculture because of those bad examples that I was telling you about earlier. But agriculture can be actually really good if it's done well, and. Unfortunately, in the U.S., we're a little bit behind when it comes to agriculture production compared to other countries, and we need to make sure that we step up because the demand, as I said, is increasing for seafood. And some of our wild stocks cannot take, we cannot take more than we have been taking, so we do need better agriculture. And good thing is that agriculture, just like commercial fisheries, operates on their very robust environmental protection, so it's heavily, heavily monitored to make sure that there's no you know, damage to the ecosystem or the species or wildlife population, wild populations of fish. Again, you can learn more about that at the Fish Watch and the NOAA page. So what do you need to do? Should you stop eating seafood? No, obviously not. You don't want to be eating, stop eating seafood. I'd show you that seafood is, can be extremely healthy for you and it, it can be sustainable. So, but what do you need to do? You need to know where your seafood come from. You are, if you go to the supermarket, for example, all seafood should be tells you where, where it's coming from, where it was caught and how, at least for most part. And that give you indication where it's coming from. So if it's coming from the United States, you already learned in the previous slide that we have very strict rules. So for that instance, you can say, yeah, this is sustainable seafood because it is caught here. If it's not caught in the United States, I'm going to give you some examples of things that you could do. But the best thing is to eat local um, and support your local fisheries um, because you know, it's people that work here, people that contribute to your economy. And then we know that they've been regulated very heavily so that you know that seafood is um, sustainable. 
you need to learn about the seafood that you're eating. So if you know you like tuna, find out where the tuna is coming from, find out how it's fish. All those things can help you make better decisions about sustainability. Also, you can support environmental stewardship. There's what I call eco labels. Some organizations um, have these labels to, to show the public something that they can identify and see this is either, you know, fr it's dolphin friendly. So when you're catching this fish, you know, killing uh, dolphins, it's sustainable, sustainable certified. Some of these eco labels, however, they, you, they do, the industries have to pay to get them, but it's outside reviewers who do this. So it's not, you know, paying somebody to give you stickers, as you said, you actually get into the process that's you're going to send external evaluators and evaluate your industry. This is not, um, I think this is a good tool, especially with seafood that is coming from all the places, um, because you don't know, but anyway, those tools exist and it have to help people make decisions. But again, if it is caught in the United States, you know, for all these regulational things that I told you, you are supporting a sustainable fisheries. So the fish watch that I've been talking about in the NOAA page, it's a very good resource. It's a beautiful, um, it's a very easy friendly, I should say, to navigate, to navigate very user-friendly website that you can use. This is how it looks like if you go to fish watch, I think this is the main point of entry that you get. You can type the fish that you're looking for or that you wanna um, buy or eat at a restaurant and then it can tell you all the information about you know, the population status. And this is just a quick sample, I did black grouper Angela, by the way, Angela Collins, Dr. Angela Collins, she's an expert in groupers. So if you have a specific question about groupers, I'm gonna put it in the spot, you can ask her later. But anyway, here, this is an example. If you type black grouper, it will give you the scientific name of the species, obviously. It will give you the population status, as you can see here. It will tell you, and this is extremely important, how the fisher is impacting the habitat where the species live. Remember, we will want to impact the environment where the species live because then you you jeopardize the health of that population and the other ones related to this, related, you know, to that site. So in this case, um, it has very, very minimal impact on the on the habitat. So that will be a great choice. Fishing rate is at recommended level. So again, this this information about the fishing rates, it comes from those those scientists looking into all this data to try to make you know to look at the trends over time, and for, with through the progressionary approach make decisions. So not to put that. Uh, stock in, in jeopardy. So that's what right now the, the black grouper is at recommended levels. And bycatch is what I was telling you about the example of the picture they were throwing all these dead animals. So we always want to minimize bycatch because you don't want to be throwing stuff that you're not going to use and that can have an impact on the environment as well. So this is a good fishery because it has very minimum bycatch. And also the sites, which is great, it gives you um, where can you find the, the taste of the fish, it's healthy benefits. So you actually break it down for you know levels how many fats, how much protein, and all the different things that they have. And even the biomes, like I think, like I, I just did a program last night that I cooked mahi-mahi. And I think it's like eight ounces of mahi-mahi or six ounces, it's like 31 proteins of grams of protein, uh, grams of protein, sorry. So it gives you very detailed information about the health benefits of the seafood that you intended to eat. Texture, nutritional facts, I say, and some recipes, which is great. Um, and that's just one example, but they have many different species here that you've probably seen in the market or reference. So it is awesome. I think it's a great tool. There's all the products that you can use um, that they are out there. So it's worth mentioning because a lot of people know about this. This is the Seafood Watch from Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is an app that you can download to your phone. By the way, you can access the Fish Watch to your phone too if you have a smartphone. This is another one that has been put out there um, and they have their own way to to um, look at sustainability and seafood, but it's highly accepted for some folks. So again, some people have used this in the past and you've probably seen it. What I like about the Seafood Watch is that it gives you information about fisheries outside the United States. So if I'm at the market and I'm, and I don't know if it's, U if it, I know it's not US, at least Fish Watch only concentrates on national source of, of um, species, information from species at national level. This one at least tells you a little bit. So if I see something that looks doesn't look good to me, that says there, I'm like, okay, no. Um, okay, so there, there it is. And this is just an example of things that uh, it tells you, um, you know, by location, where you can go buy it, and type of fish, if it's wild, if it's farm. So it's very similar to Fish Watch. 
it tells you to avoid it or not, depending on things that I already mentioned. All right. And that's another thing that if you go to a restaurant, you're entitled to ask, where is this fish coming from? How is it caught? And you should ask those questions because if they don't have the answers, um, there's something they will think about that the customers are asking. And I can see that a lot of restaurants that I've been going to a longer time and they kind of get to know me, they put more effort into finding out is because I do want to know. So you should know what you're eating and that to ch make sure that you care and to make sure that what they saw in you is you know, coming from sustainable fisheries. All right. So another good way, good resource to find sustainable seafood is by looking to the, this website right here. Uh, this is a national fisherman website. So nationalfisherman.com. You can find local seafood and you can look at, look at seafood products that are available, you know, availability of the seafood products, where all those markets are and where you can go. So it's another great resource if you cannot go out, especially now that we're limited into our mobility due to the COVID-19, there's ways that you can buy seafood locally. And even there's a lot of seafood that can be cheap to you. A lot of people don't know this, but you can actually order food to come to your house. So there's no excuse to stop eating seafood, which again, it has so many health benefits that we should increase or continue eating seafood. Another good resources to find um, where to find sustainable seafood is the FDAC website, which you have right here on the top of this page. And the good thing about this is the Florida ranks among the top 12 United States where, um, where fresh food, seafood production. And again, we have highly regulated seafood industry, so you can you know, feel comfortable that this is sustainable fishery. So we do have a great production of seafood. We catch more than 80% of the national supply for pooper, pompon and mullet, stone crab, pink shrimp, spiny lobster, spiny mackerel. So big production of those, um, of those industries right there, which is great. So this is just an example of how the waste looks like. You go in into the FDAC site and you can actually look for browns by city or by county or by zip code even. And it will give you a detailed map. And I just did this, it's a screenshot of, um, I was looking, you know, I, I think I did Sarasota and then I opened it up a little more and then I expanded a map and gave me a bunch of sites that are listed here. So this is another great resource for you to find out what local markets are nearby you. And you can call them. Like I cook um, Magra Snapper a couple months ago and I did call my market and I asked him, hey, do you have it? You know, how fresh it is? Sometimes you cannot ask those questions at the supermarket because they're pretty busy. But if you call in advance, ask them what do they have, if they have time to answer those questions, which make me feel much better about what I was eating. I knew that the, the, they told me when they got the fish, where was it from, you know, so it makes me feel good. So that's a great resource, like I said. Um, and they also show you recipes like the First Watch website, and they also give you details about when, let's say you want red mango, no, a red snapper. It will tell you if the season is closed, which months and which one is not, which is another great information to know, you know, if you're eating sustainable product by knowing when actually it should be sold. Or maybe they sold to you because it's been frozen, but anyway, so you get more information about the species. So it's a great resource for you to explore. We also have Florida Sea Grant. We have a huge, uh, an awesome program, uh, at least I think it's awesome. Uh, it's called Seafood at Your Fingertips. So what we've been doing, a bunch of agents, um, Angela, participates in that as well as uh, I, myself. We are cooking online, basically, a live, in a, during a Facebook Live event. I did Mahi Mahi wrapping banana leaves yesterday. So basically, we're telling you how to cook your seafood. We provide information about the ecology and the biology of the animals. We're providing recipes and, um, and regulation information and some of the cool facts about the species that we are interested in. But we've basically been doing this now for as I said, like five months or so. We're on our second season, which started yesterday. This happens every Wednesday at 6 p.m. You can go to the Florida Seagram um, Florida Seagram page on web and our Facebook page every Wednesday, just a little bit before 6 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Central time, and you will see the live presentation. So it's pretty funny and it's very, very informative and very pleased. And I'm very pleased with what we put out there. So that's another resource that you have not to learn about seafood that you might consume, but also have to cook it because it's, a, it's also another problem that we have. A lot of people depend on restaurants to eat their seafood, the seafood consumption, even though we highly pr we produce a lot of seafood in the state, 
most of the seafood is consumed in restaurants and not at home. And that happens at a national level too. Most of the seafood is, and nothing wrong with going to a restaurant and supporting your local economy. But let's say you can't, so you should still eat eating seafood. So this is another way to continue, you know, adding healthy food to your system. Before we go into uh, questions, I'm gonna quick send a quick poll here. Let me see if I can grab my controls back yet. And I'll be, it's a very short poll. So if you can please um, attend this poll, that would be great. It just help us, it's totally anonymous, but it will help us design better our program. You can be pretty honest, you won't hurt my feelings. I'll give it three more seconds. All right, I think that's it. I don't see the bars moving. All right. So you see the pole there? Well, that's good. All right. Let me get to my next slide. Uh, well, thank you. This is a not very long presentation, but um, I do want to leave enough time for questions. And this is our contact information for myself and Dr. Angela Collins. She's in Manatee County. I'm in Sarasota County. But I'm going to stop sharing because I do want to hear from you. So hopefully there's some questions that we can address. Thanks, Armando. I don't have any questions waiting in the Q&A box, but now is your opportunity. Um, there's a question about uh, the seafood cooking classes. Can you talk about how people can view those? Say it again, sorry. I was trying to look for something. Uh, the, the cooking classes that you all are doing, the seafood at your fingertips, how do people um, watch those? Yes, so that's um, done through a Facebook page. So you do have to have a social media account, but if you wanna watch it live, however, we do have them we record all those shows and we put them in our for a sea grand seafood at your fingertips site so maybe i can type that in the chat panel but you can access it through our website and they are all recorded so you can go to a specific recipe and look at a recipe card i, I don't know if i mentioned that there's a whole recipe card that tie into the blog that we do the week before and then to the to the video so you don't have to watch the video to learn how to cook this you can just go directly to the recipe card and then you know prepare your seafood which is a great place. Great. Uh, so a couple of questions have come in. The first mm -hmm. one is related to um, commercial fishing and whether or not individuals who are practicing commercial fishing specialize in one type of fish or do they haul in lots of types and kind of, um, you know, go with what they get. Angela, you want to go ahead? Yeah, so that's a great question, and that does um, depend on the fishing vessel in question. So a lot of fishermen do specialize in certain species. So for instance, they might target um, bait fish, or they might target the grouper snapper complex, which are reef associated, which take a specific type of gear. So um, most of the time, most fishermen um, are targeting a specific type or species group, species complex when they're fishing. Um, but at the same time, some of the fishermen will definitely um, keep things that they can sell, even if it's not part of the target suite of species they might have been um, targeting that day. Okay, great. Um, and the next question is, how are charter boats and private vessels monitored to assure legal size limits and seasons are observed? Go ahead, Angela. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that is another excellent question. Um, commercial fisheries are highly regulated in the US. Um, so all of our commercial fishermen have to abide by a series of regulations um, and rules. There are observer monitoring programs and dock intercepts, um, charter 
or not charter, but um, commercial anglers need to submit trip tickets. So they have to document all of their landings by species, um, total number, total weight, things like that. So all of those things are monitored um, through a system of paperwork that goes through our state and federal governments, depending on which fishery we're talking about. Um, so yeah, they are highly regulated and um, they are they are pretty well enforced. I would say that um, the US and the state of Florida are some of the most well managed and um, well regulated as far as actually having a regulation in place and then following through and making sure that those regulations are being followed. Um, the US does a, does a very good job at that. So there, yep, that, I think I'm gonna ramble here, but I'll stop talking about it. There are lots of, lots of things in place to make sure that those guys are following the rules. Yeah, and a lot of this has been, you know, case studies. So they've been learning through, through time, you know, looking at stocks and trying to record them. So there's a lot of um, conservation efforts as well. So this is, you know, you know arbitrary kind of thing. It's actually a you know, well study. Right. There's a couple of questions about um, aquaculture in Sarasota Bay and whether or not there is any aquaculture in Sarasota Bay um, and a question about uh, apparently it seemed it seemed to have been controversial so they're wondering what the status is on that if you know anything about it well I know there's aquaculture of selfish in Manatee County right yeah yeah. yeah, so there, there's actually, there's no shellfish aquaculture in Sarasota Bay. The shellfish aquaculture is in Tampa Bay. So these are commercial shellfish leases that um, are regulated through the state of Florida and they're growing clams and oysters on the southeastern portion of Tampa Bay. But I think the question is probably related to the offshore aquaculture operation that's been proposed off of Sarasota. Um, that is a pilot project that has been proposed that would go in, it would be putting net pens, big, large floating net pens um, to farm Almaco Jack um, in, again, large offshore pens, and it would be about 40 to 50 miles off the coast of Sarasota. And this is currently in the review process with the EPA. Um, so that is still under review. It, it had initially been, um, it had gone through multiple levels of approval and then um, public comment. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of public concern over this. So EPA is actually just, I actually just checked about this a couple of weeks ago. EPA is still in the process of reviewing those comments on um, whether or not that permit is going to be uh, appealed or moved forward. So, um, but that being said, I, I think that we are going to be seeing a lot more offshore aquaculture permitting processes going into place over the next 10 years, simply because of the direction um, that our seafood production is moving. You know, consumption is up, um, demand is up, but our wild capture fisheries can only handle so much of that. So um, responsible aquaculture is one of those things that might be utilized as another way to provide that, you know, that fish protein. And I'm just going to add that even though it might seem, you know, like a tedious process to get into it, but that makes it more transparent. And even though that difficulty of getting the permits and all the public hearing and the, in the, in the allowing people to speak, that's to me, that's a sign that you, you want to do something right. So, you know, it's not just somebody making a decision, which you, you can see in other parts of the globe. And then it's too late. Okay, uh, next question is just, someone's a little bit concerned about farm raised fish. And I think there needs to be some clarification there between, you know, different types of aquaculture. Um, and, you know, so this person is asking about the health of farm raised fish and whether yeah. it's healthy and safe to eat. And that's what aquaculture has a bad rep because, you know, people, you have a tendency to remember the bad things, not as much of the good things. So there's some, you know, some bad aquaculture, obviously, a lot of use of um, uh, antibiotics and many different things, you know, fish growing in very poor conditions, you know, escapee scenarios that they maybe they shouldn't be. So those are the things, and that's why it's so hard now to just to open a culture because they want to make sure that you are, you have a plan, you know what you're going to do it. So I wouldn't be concerned uh, as much, you know, especially here in the United States. If it's coming from another country, then it might be a different story. That's when those eco labels um, help as well. But Angela, you want to say something else? 
No, I would I would just reiterate what you just said, Armando. That's that's a good answer. I think um, you know aquaculture has come a long way since its initiation, and um, many of the, especially the U.S. Uh, produced aquacultured fish are are in pretty good they're pretty good living conditions, um, well circulated systems, um, like an aquarium type setting. So um, they're not they're not necessarily in in gross water. You know they do have regulations that they've got to follow to make sure that those fish are um, well taken care of before they go out for consumption. And another thing that you can do if you want to you know help your native fish population eat invasive species like lionfish. So there's lionfish dervis. It's a wonderful, tasty fish. It's just not, doesn't belong to our water. So that's another way that you can increase your seafood consumption and help native um, population of fish. Lionfish are delicious. <laughs> there you go. And there's many ways that you, a lot of people are, you know, scared about the um, venom and the spines, but there's ways to, to, yeah, to remove the spines without any problem. If there are the venom, you kill it by heat. So if you pan fry the whole fish, then there's no problems and many different. So we have a lot of information on Flora Sea Grant website and FWC too, so. All right, so question about uh, mercury levels in salmon. And um, if you live in Florida and you want to eat salmon, what's kind of the most sustainable way to do so? Well, it, first, you know, U.S. product that gonna be easier to know if it's you know, what kind of regulations are on the fishery. That's for sure. A lot of, as I said, because a lot of people are um, care about mercury, then a lot of these seafood products actually say you know mer free of mercury, or they even test it. So there's a lot of information about the product that you having, and a lot of labels included include. Included there, you can also look at the fish uh, watch or the, do your own research, you know, and look at levels of, uh, of mercury accumulated in those species. There's some of them just because, as I told you, the life history, which is where do they live, how fast do they grow, they have a tendency to maybe accumulate more mercury than others. So you know, sardines comparing to a bluefin uh, or marlin, then the levels of mercury that a sardine will accumulate through its lifetime is very minimal compared to a huge slowing fish. Um, so just just find out more about the species and, and again, but the, all the benefits are weight the risk. So unless you really, you know, like maybe a pregnant um, woman or like a, somebody with a very um, compromised immune system, but otherwise it will be really hard to get a lot of mercury in your body by eating a lot of seafood, unless it was from a, one of those mercury hotspots like happened in Japan, obviously that the whole system was totally heavily polluted with mercury. So do your research, but don't worry too much. I think this has been a lot of worries on people and it's because they don't know all the details about it. Yeah, I would just, I would want to reiterate a little bit about that mercury concern. There, um, there's there been a lot of d data and um, research on this topic over the past decade or so that has really sort of shifted the way that consumers need to think about mercury. They're not, it's not nearly the, the levels of concern for mercury are not nearly as high as they used to be as far as consuming our wild seafood products. There are certain spaces, some of the Great Lakes fish, for example, um, that are near industrial output, you know, historical industrial output, and they're in, contained within freshwater systems. There are some species in the Great Lakes that are still a cause for concern. And then again, some of our really top level predators like our sharks um, and wahoo still contain, you know, levels of mercury that you wouldn't want to have it every day for dinner. But most of the species out there available for consumption, not a problem. It's actually probably more risky for you to avoid seafood because seafood has so many health benefits. And I'm not just saying that because I love our seafood producers. I really, there's a lot of literature out there that supports the benefits of consuming seafood and the risks of not consuming enough of it. So eat your yep. seafood. Um, and then as far as farm-raised salmon, most of the time, those guys um, are processed at, a, at an age where they haven't had that long of a life anyway. So there's not a lot of time for high levels of bioaccumulation of heavy metals or toxins. Yeah. Are there um, any specific countries that you would suggest avoiding seafood products from due to whether they're, you know, let's say less sustainable? No, uh, I think you have to look at it by species, by stock. That would be to, 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 yeah, 
to grow <laughs> to be in a country. I think if you look at the species, um, you know, there's some stocks that are totally declining and recognized and well known. So you don't want to be, you know, eating that particular stock of fish. And there's, as I said, there's resources that you can read and find out about that particular species. So if you can wait, hold on into eating something before you find out a little bit more, that's at least that's what I do. You know, if I go to the supermarket and I see, and I'm going to say Chilean sea bass is bad. It might be, I don't know. But if I see something that I know is something I don't know, I don't go in for the thing I don't know. I find out a little bit more and then I go buy it. Um, in, at the meantime, I buy the shrimp, you know, I buy the mang red, mangro, um, red, the mangrove snapper or something like that. That is local that I know of. So there's a lot of ways that you can inform. And if you do have questions, I mean, that's what we're here for. So we can guide you to the right place if you have particular questions about a particular stock. But yeah, I wouldn't single out a particular country. I was going to say Canada is so fun, but that, I don't have anything in Canadians, which is a joke. All right. Well, the, the last question that kind of came into the chat box was related to redfish and when it's served at a restaurant, what species is it really? And what, what is it redfish or is it something else? Um, I don't know if you want to tackle that one. <laughs> That's a big problem. Sometimes, you know, the, the restaurant, they don't know. And there's case studies that they look at. Actually, they've done DNA analysis going to restaurants and looking at DNA and seeing if what they're selling is actually the fish. Sometimes it's not even the fault of the restaurant. It's for the the people that sell the fish and they tell them that, you know, sometimes it's filet, so they don't know what fish is. So that, that's why I think that it's, for, it's our responsibility as a customer to ask those questions because if they don't know, then they're gonna, if more people ask them, they're going to start finding out. Um, some of the best seafood restaurants are the ones that actually can show you a whole fish. And that way you, you can see your fish. Obviously, if you don't know what you're looking at, then you might have a problem there. But that's what educating yourself and asking those questions will help the restaurants too in the industry and they will put more effort into finding out. And we do have very great examples of restaurants. They, they do care about that and they inform themselves and they tell you in advance, um, I'm not gonna you know, advertise in a restaurant, but I've been to ones that even don't have to be caught, like what kind of fisheries is this and when, so that those are great things. Yeah, so a lot of people don't know and they can sell you anything, but if we keep continuing without knowing, they're gonna just, still get away and maybe they don't want to get away. They just don't know and they don't know you care. So it's on us. I just have to jump in real quick about, I saw a question flash through about what the best fishy fish to eat locally mm -hmm. is. And so I just wanted to address that real quick and give a shout out to the mullet, um, the mighty mullet. It, it gets a bad rap, but it's delicious. And mm -hmm. if you like fishy fish, I highly recommend mullet. It's way more local than salmon. And um, it's also really good to eat. And we're starting to get into the fall, which is prime mullet harvesting season. So you might start seeing it at some of your local seafood providers more often in the fall. Smoke mullet, the best. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, it was a great presentation. And um, if you are interested in more of these types of topics, please check out our next um, webinar in the series on sustainability and uh, check out our various YouTube pages and Facebooks. We have all kinds of videos up on, on all kinds of topics that you might be interested in. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Armando. Thanks, Angela.